Well, hi, friends. Matthew Dowling here, preaching minister, hospital chaplain, and lead teacher for Strengthened by Grace Ministries. And uh, we are continuing to think about what the Bible says about the end times. And today's topic of the video is, how do we know Jesus is literally returning to earth? I mean, how do we know? Some years ago, I saw a bumper sticker that read, Jesus is coming back. Look busy. <laughs> Another bumper sticker I saw one time stated, Jesus is coming back, and boy, is he ticked off. Well, you know, both of those bumper stickers, not help, not helpful, honestly. Uh, they portray a Christ who is like uh, an absent boss or an overstrict uh, parent. They don't frankly really help us think too much about uh, things. And neither of them are really accurate. Now, it's true that Jesus is returning, and he will indeed uh, bring wrath when he comes, if you read the book of Revelation. But beyond judgment, he's also coming to reign in righteousness. That's the point of what Revelation 19 says about Jesus's uh, return. But of course, that really begs a question. Can we be certain about Jesus's coming back? You know, the message of Christ's return it's been on the lips of the church for 2000 years. And, um, you know, if we were really to put together an honest bumper sticker, an honest bumper sticker today would say something like Jesus is coming back soon, very soon. But then we encounter people who are not so sure about that. Right. And they ask the question, well, is he really? And if so, how can we be sure? How can we know Jesus's return is going to be an actual physical appearance? Now, keep in mind that we're talking about the second coming of Christ portrayed in Revelation 19. I'm not talking now about the rapture event, which we're going to discuss in a future video. Those are two separate appearances, okay? So to begin, what I want to do is I want to consider that there are only really three possibilities about how Jesus's second coming is going to occur. First, um, he will return to planet Earth. That's one of the first options. Two, he will not return at all. That's another option. Or three, he has actually already returned, at least kind of. And so... Um, we're going to discuss those options. Of course, if Jesus is not coming back at all, then the discussion really doesn't really take us anywhere. It's effectively over. Uh, there's no way to verify that possibility because no one can definitively prove that Jesus is not coming back at some point. Now, granted, if his return is nothing more than a myth, then everything else in the Bible uh, that uh, the Bible claims about Jesus is probably questionable and suspect as well. Because, you know, if we can't even trust the scriptures that speak about the Lord's return, then how can we trust other passages which speak about other important matters like morality or salvation or heaven or hell or eternal life? So three possibilities. Jesus will return. Two, Jesus won't return. Three, Jesus has already returned. Kind of. Okay. So um, if it's true that... Christ will make another trip back to earth. He will return for a second time, what's called the second coming of Christ. Then we still are faced with two potential options. First, Jesus's return will be spiritual and not physical, or two, he will indeed show up in a physical glorified body. So the first thing I want to do is just ask, how will Jesus return? You know, if he's not going to return at all, then things are over. Just to be clear, though, the Bible is very clear that he will return. So we're just going to lose that option altogether, that he won't return at all. But the question is now, how will he return? So let's first explore the view that sees Jesus' second coming as spiritual and not physical. Okay. Now, typically those who hold this belief fall under an interpretive view known as preterism. And preterism interprets the events described in Revelation 6 through 19 as having already been fulfilled all the way back in the first century, AD 70, when Jerusalem was destroyed by General Titus. Now, within this approach to Revelation are three kind of 
underviews of what's called preterism. There's mild, there's moderate, and there's extreme. And the thing that's true about all of these three views or subviews of preterism is they all three see uh, revelation as being historically fulfilled already in the first century. Now, most preterists still believe in a future uh, coming of Christ. However, extreme preterists believe he already returned in AD 70 and that it was a spiritual return, not a physical one. Now, it's obvious to all of us that Jesus did not arrive physically at Armageddon in the first century and killed the world's armies as described in Revelation 19, verses 11 through 21. And so for extreme preterists, Jesus's return must of necessity have been spiritual and symbolic in nature. In fact, preterists are often forced to symbolize the majority of the prophecies and events in Revelation because there are no historical records or incidents that support the claim that the judgments described in Revelation 6 to 19 have ever occurred in Jerusalem or Israel or anywhere in the world during the first century or frankly anywhere else since that time. Now, as the book of Revelation describes, half of the world's population would have perished amidst world wars and cataclysmic judgments back then, well, we should expect that at least one person or scribe or historian would have written that fact down. But there's nothing. There's nada. Thus, preterists, they spiritualize, they symbolize virtually all of the prophecies and events in Revelation in order for them to make sense according to their views. And so there is a, a view out there that Jesus' return was spiritual, and it was back in the first century. But to be frank, I reject that altogether. I just don't think it's true, and it doesn't seem biblical. And this really, really leaves us with the second option or second interpretation, that the judgments described in Revelation chapter 6 to 19 and Jesus' second coming are literal. And what that means is they are still uh, yet to have happened, they're in the future. Now, let's consider the support for this perspective. The first line of evidence would be that Jesus's birth and existence were literal. I mean, virtually no historian or theologian today denies the historicity of Jesus Christ. The fact of his birth and his life and his death that they are attested to by the religious as well as secular scholars, including the Jewish historian Josephus, the Roman historian Tacitus, the Roman historian Pliny the Younger, and scores of others who attest to the actual literal existence of Jesus. So to allege that Jesus never existed is to make an ignorant, a baseless claim. But also Jesus's resurrection was literal. It involved a physical body. And when Christ rose from the dead, he made it very clear to his followers that he did in fact possess a physical body, even though when he came back, it was in a glorified, a supernatural state. In fact, the Lord said in Luke 24, verse 39, touch me and see, right? For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. In fact, we're told in scripture that at the tomb, Mary clung to Jesus's physical body in John 20, verse 17. And later that Sunday evening, he appeared to the disciples. He showed him his hands. He showed him his side. And eight days later, Thomas was invited to touch Jesus's hands and the wounds in his side. So Jesus's resurrection was physical. It was bodily. It was tangible. And this brings us to a third line of evidence, why Jesus is literally going to return in his physical body. Thirdly, Jesus promised to physically and literally return at the end of the age. He made that promise in Matthew 16, verse 27, Matthew 24, verse 30 and 36, uh, Matthew 24, verses 42 through 44, and then in Luke 21, verses 34 through 36, and then we're told that he will return literally, physically in the, the body in Revelation 19, verses 11 through 16. In fact, there are more than 200 references to the physical second coming of Christ in the New Testament, and not one of them hints at anything other than a physical return. In fact, Jesus himself spoke of this physical return over 20 times in the Gospels. Well, the fourth line of evidence that Jesus will return physically and literally is that the two angels at Jesus's ascension, when he went up to heaven, promised that Jesus would return physically to the same spot from which he ascended. 
In fact, they said this, this Jesus will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. That's Acts chapter one, verse 11. And so at Jesus's physical ascension, we were promised a physical return. That alone, I think, is one of the most powerful evidences, the testimony of the angels at Jesus's ascension. But fifthly, the Apostle Paul prophesied that Jesus would be, listen to these words in 2 Thessalonians 1.7, that Jesus would be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire. In fact, Paul's words here clearly communicate an actual language of Jesus's return. And then number six, scripture says that Jesus's return will be visible. Every eye will see when he comes on the clouds of heaven. We're told that in Matthew chapter 24, verses 27 through 30, and then Matthew 26, verse 64. We're also told that in Revelation 1, 7. And so Jesus's return, we will see it. It's not a spiritual event. It's a physical event, and we're going to see it. And then the seventh line of evidence is the Bible references specific geographic locations associated with the second coming of Christ. Places like Armageddon in Revelation 16, places like the Mount of Olives referenced in Zechariah 14, verses 3 through 4, and Acts 1, verses 9 through 11. We're told he'll return to Jerusalem. That's Zechariah 12, verses 1 through 3, Zechariah 14, 2, and then Revelation 16, verses 17 through 21. These are real places, and they're going to welcome a real king on a real white horse, as foretold in Revelation 19, 11, with a real Jesus on the horse's back. And so the Bible's references to real places, physical places, geographical places, give us a sense that Jesus is going to return, of course, physically. And then the eighth line of evidence is that literal global armies are, we are told, going to assemble to do battle at Armageddon against the risen Christ. We're told that in Revelation 19, verses 19 through 21. That's not a figurative or a symbolic event. It's going to be a literal event. And those real armies are going to try to do battle against Jesus at the Battle of Armageddon. But of course, that will not work out well for these armies. And then number nine, a literal second coming of Christ is what will usher in a literal thousand year millennial kingdom. That's what's foretold in Revelation 19 and 20. And here's what's important. This is the 10th line of evidence. Understanding Jesus's return is based on a literal approach to interpreting all of scripture, including the book of Revelation. The early church adopted this interpretive approach and expected any day to see the same Jesus who had left them for heaven uh, years earlier. And when you look at scripture, you need to realize that 100% of the first coming prophecies of Jesus were fulfilled literally. Just as foretold by the prophets, there was a real baby born in Bethlehem long ago. And for that reason, I think it's very reasonable, very reasonable in light of all the other, uh, other evidence to realize that 100% of the second coming prophecies will be fulfilled literally themselves. Now, why embrace this? It's because the second coming of Jesus Christ is the climax of Revelation's prophetic narrative. It marks the crescendo, if you will, of human history. It's a red letter date on God's calendar. And if we can't trust it to be real, then how can we trust anything else in the book of Revelation to be real? Therefore, by all indications, the Bible prophesies a literal, a future, a physical return of our Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that good news, my friends? We want to be ready to meet the King, and you need to get ready today. You need to repent of your sins and place your faith in Jesus Christ. You need to be baptized for the forgiveness of sins, and you need to get into a Bible-believing church where you can learn about these wonderful, wonderful truths uh, from God's Word. And God is so good to give us His Word. In fact, God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. I thank you for joining me today as we've considered this evidence together from God's word. And until next time, dear friends, may God bless you.